we took that footage almost a year ago. I guess it was about 10 months ago. We may have done it in late April. Just the, the opening scene of Michigan. So it's actually season appropriate at this point. I wanted to show a prepping picture. The title of my show tonight is, if you haven't started prepping, it may already be too late. I don't want to scare you. I mean, you can always do something, but uh, we are out there, or we are starting on getting all of our plants ready. Matt and I have been very busy with this. We've had, uh, we've been standing around for several hours, a couple of nights, just getting the seeds and putting them <clears throat> in a slightly damp paper towel. So you get a bunch of seeds and you spread them out, you separate them, you put it on a slightly damp paper towel and fold it over and then put it in this plastic baggie and then leave it out in the sunroom for a couple of days and it uh, it sprouts germinates the seed and then after the seed is germinated then you put it in the dirt and that just makes it a lot easier <clears throat> it gives you a much higher success rate for the germination so we've started on this we're actually slightly behind we need to be getting all of our seeds done we're staggering things like the tomatoes and bell peppers and broccoli because they're like um, harvested at, during a finite period and it's growth whereas something like kale or spinach you harvest throughout the life of the plant so I'll be harvesting kale and spinach from the same plants all summer long and into the fall but like tomatoes you harvest once so we want to stagger those we've just started doing it all of our herbs like sage and parsley and dill those will also grow throughout the season we only need one of those and we don't need that much either but we're going to be doing a lot more and uh, this was just the beginning we've done a lot more since then already and i've started getting all the potatoes ready we also got 10 more baby chicks and uh, also we have four egg layers right now. I've started with the rabbits. I've started putting them in the same bin together so that they can mate. We can get some more rabbits pretty soon here. But we are we're working pretty hard getting everything ready. We just put up a supply tent. So uh, yeah, the wheels are turning with that and we're working pretty hard on all that stuff. I very strongly recommend you do all of that stuff too. Even if we don't have some grandiose SHTF type, uh, SHTF type of event, food is getting expensive, which we will discuss more later on in the show. But food is actually, the price is increasing very quickly. The more you can do to limit how much you're going to have to buy at the store later, the better off you're going to be. Just take my suggestion, get a garden going. Even if you live in the city and maybe you only have a little patio, put out some pots and just try to get a, a little garden going on, on your patio or in your balcony. Do something because food's going to get super duper expensive. Store as much as you can. Do it. Okay, let's look at some of the comments that we've got so far over here on Entropy. Uh, Alkman says, anybody else out there or is my Wi-Fi cutting out again? Mine looks okay. So I think it's just yours. Everybody else on uh, Entropy is saying hello and hello to everybody over here. Black Magic says, Look like, looks like the rabbits will have plenty of food. What about you, Laurel? Uh, <laughs> for the, we keep the rabbits separate from our uh from the garden so the rabbits are not going to be allowed to go out into the garden actually what we're going to do is there's going to be an electric fence around the property it's five acres um we have to put that down pretty soon too and then the dogs will be able to run around the property there'll be an inner fence that goes around the garden so that the dogs can't go into the garden and trample it or eat anything in there but the gar the dogs will be in between the outside and the garden so any kind of rabbit or deer or anything like that that gets in that area is going to regret it because the dogs will go after them for the chickens I, we need to get ducks because ducks are actually much better at eating the bugs out of the garden and not eating the garden <coughs> my chickens the last couple of years they um they ate the bugs so they like save the kale because they ate all they ate the bugs off of the kale but they also ate my strawberries so ducks my understanding is ducks don't do that. Ducks will just eat the bugs and they won't eat the plants. I've been sneezing and blowing my nose all day. I'm probably going to do it throughout the show tonight. 
because I, I think it's just spring allergies. Also, Matt's been cleaning the house. He says maybe that's it. I don't know. I feel like I was sneezing before he started cleaning. But uh, unfortunately, that is going to be a feature of the show tonight. Alrighty, let's jump into some of the stories that we've got here. So, uh, China, not China, Russia has started using hypersonic missiles. I have commented in previous shows that Russia seemed to be holding back. I think in a lot of respects they still are. Somebody commented that they had did some very sophisticated airstrikes. Yes, a, a couple. They weren't using their hypersonic missiles. Um, I don't know that they need to use hypersonic missiles in Ukraine, but they, they seem to be sort of testing out what they've got. Regardless, they have a lot more than they've been using. Um, and then, you know, as I said before, it begs the question, what are they saving it for? A couple of people answered the question. They're like, for a war with NATO. Th thank you. That is what I was implying. <laughs> but I'm glad a couple of people realized that. The hypersonic missiles. Uh, also, somebody asked, what's so great about the hypersonic missiles? Uh, what's so great about them is we can't intercept them. For a lot of other types of missiles, we have defense systems that actually intercept the missile before it hits the ground. So it goes up and we've got another one that goes and shoots it down. For the hypersonic missiles, we can't do that. They're too fast. Uh, and uh, they can reach not only sites in Ukraine. As I said, they probably don't need to do it in Ukraine, but they, they seem to be testing out what they have. Um, they can use it for other targets, including the United States. If they go over the Arctic and come down into the U.S., it would be too fast. We don't have a lot of defense systems pointing towards Canada because in, in times past, nothing could come that way. It was too far. But with some of the new technology that Russia has, it can actually come over the Arctic over Canada and hit us that way and it would be it would be too quick we wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be able to intercept the missiles so they have been testing out some of their missiles um, in this confrontation with Ukraine let's see a little clip about that one Tonight, the Russian Defense Ministry claiming their forces deployed hypersonic missiles for the first time in this war the Russians say hypersonic missiles, seen here in this video from a February training exercise before the invasion, were used in a Friday strike on a Ukrainian armed forces ammunition depot in the southwest of the country. Russia claims they can reach targets over 1,200 miles away, Probably forever. traveling at five times the speed of sound. The missiles are difficult for defense systems to detect and shoot down. Part of the Russian arsenal is long-range missiles aimed at Ukraine. Putin relying on his air power as ground forces continue to stall. The fact that Putin is having to use these very sophisticated, very expensive kinds of weapons where he launches from within Russia tells you just how effective the Ukrainian Air Force and air defenses have been in taking the Russian Air Force out of the equation. Okay, that was ridiculous. This guy, this commentator, is saying that Russia using these very sophisticated weapons that we have no defense against is somehow proof that the Ukrainian military is really strong. I mean, come on, that's just dumb. They they are trying to they are trying so hard to spin this to say the Ukraine is amazing that even when they just get pummeled by these sophisticated weapons and can't do anything about it, that still means Ukraine is strong. That that's just dumb. That's just dumb. Let's hear him say it again. Of kinds of weapons where he launches from within Russia tells you just how effective the Ukrainian Air Force and air defenses have been in taking the Russian Air Force out of the equation. The Pentagon saying Russia's fired over a thousand missiles into Ukraine since the beginning of this conflict. A large-scale airstrike killing dozens of Ukrainian soldiers at a military facility in Mykolaiv. Verified videos circulating on social media showing explosions at an aircraft repair facility near Lviv's main airport Friday. Russia firing six cruise missiles from the Black Sea, hundreds of miles away. Ukraine claims at least two were intercepted. That airstrike bringing the war into what was once considered a safe haven, Lviv, just 40 miles from the Polish border. Nearly every conversation we hear walking down the street right now is about that explosion on Friday. Lviv has already welcomed hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people. This city is at capacity right now. And now the big fear is as this war moves further and further west, where are all of these people going to go? I don't know. Oh, wait, it's starting now. Started the next video. Don't start the next video. Uh, 
so so they use their missiles they probably didn't need to as was mentioned earlier their air force has actually been doing a pretty good job of destroying all of ukraine's airports and and they probably didn't need to use the hypersonic missiles but they may be just trying them out because they wanted to test them and also because they want to show nato and the united states we really do have these weapons and we really can use them against you. It was sort of a warning. Um, but yeah, so they started using some more of their other equipment just to remind us that they really do have a lot of other stuff up their sleeves. Let's look over, well here, let's look at this one. Burns, um, Matt the Man says, Laurel, what's your email? It is contactlaurel at protonmail.com. Let me write that down. Contact Laurel at protonmail.com that's also um that's in the description burns says u.s intel aircraft and our forward deployed radar systems can see them using these new weapons they are letting us see see them as a way of sending a signal to western nations yeah that's that's pretty much what i was just saying it's sort of a um you know it's it's a reminder we've got these, so be careful about making overtures that NATO is going to be joining this war very directly. Alkman says using hypersonic is a demonstration of capability. Yep. Uh, Alan Harry's Russia could destroy Ukraine if they want. They don't want to destroy Ukraine. They just want Ukraine to be a neutral place and not part of NATO. I think they want to keep Ukraine. Yes, they want it to not be part of NATO. And I think they may have in the past been satisfied if Ukraine just remained neutral. But now that they're in it and they're doing this whole war, my guess is they're like, well, fuck, if we're going to fight with them and we're going to have to have this whole war, we're going to keep it at the end. We weren't going to keep it before. We, were, we just wanted them to be neutral. But now that we had to do all this, now we're keeping it. Uh, that is what I expect will happen. But we we will see. We will see. Um, Alkman says, we are department prep, grow mushrooms in a cabinet. I have a buddy who does that because they like mushrooms and it's cheaper. So we talked about growing mushrooms. Matt and I have talked about it and he wants to do it. He wants to try it. I, that's all him. We're going to try. We have an area of woods on the, our acreage. And so we may try we may try doing some mushrooms out there. I think it's a little, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic <laughs> that it's going to go well, but we'll give it a shot. Uh, WW Clay says, just wait till Belarus enters the game. All Ukraine has to do, had to do was stuck with the Minsk Accords. Yeah. I think Ukraine really blew it, but you know, that's something, <sighs> I mean, in terms of my life, does it really matter that Ukraine blew it? No. I mean, the whole war altogether matters. It matters that it is in impacting my life and will continue to do so. But do I care if Ukraine kind of brought this on themselves or, or didn't? I don't know. Um, Super Chad, Ukraine has natural gas that would have competed with Russia. Yeah, maybe. Uh, let's go back up here. L 11Z5V, so Russia can't supply its troops, and I'm supposed to believe they can supply super, super middle, you mean missiles? Russia can't supply its troops. Be careful about the propaganda. One of the challenges that's going on right now is figuring out what to believe and what not to believe. I think we have to, you have to get your information from somewhere. Uh, it would be nice if I could just say, you know, I can't trust any of these horses, so I'm not going to listen to any of them at all. It would be great if I could do that, but then where am I going to get my information from? Am I going to go over there myself and see what's going on? So I, I have to look at what there is out there, take it all with a grain of salt that any given story might not be true, and I just have to figure, you know, what makes the most sense. And what makes the most sense is, uh, to me, in terms of military, is... A lot of military is not as competent as they would like to be, the, including the U.S. military, not always as competent as it would like to be. So are they making mistakes? I'm sure 
I, I'm sure they're making mistakes. I'm sure they're screwing st some stuff up. But it is very likely that the media is exaggerating their Russia's errors because they want everybody to believe that participating in assisting Ukraine is something that's likely to achieve a positive result. I'm not so sure that it is. Alrighty, let's go look at the, the, the video that I accidentally started to show you. Oh, I am out of focus. Let's fix that right away. Configure. There was once I was doing my show and somebody kept typing focus, focus. And I was like, am I getting distracted? Am I, am I going off topic? Why do they keep telling me to focus? And then, I, oh, oh, they meant the camera. Okay. So uh, I had commented previously in the last stream that I did last week, uh, I did a segment on it that we, I was expecting a cyber war and I was kind of wondering where it was. Where's the cyber war I was expecting? And I had looked, done some research and a lot of other experts were saying the same thing. We thought there would be a cyber war. Where is it? And then one of my subscribers pointed me to this video and I watched the whole thing. It's from this guy, Some Ordinary Gamer. There's a link in the description. And this video is about 20 minutes long. I'm only going to show you a little clip from it. It is meandering. He's not, I wanted him to say, well, he says he thinks the cyber war is actually going on right now. And I wanted him to get to the point, answer a couple questions. Uh, why do you think it's going on right now? And why aren't we seeing any effect of it? If it's going on, why do we not feel it? And he didn't answer those questions directly. Uh, he spent most of the video talking about what cyber attacks are and I'm like well that's great and everything but I there were, I had other questions um, it's still a good video what I sort of gathered and I wish he had said this more directly but what I sort of gathered from everything that he was saying and correct me if you disagree with with your with my interpretation of what he's saying is that a lot of malware needs to get where it's going and wait and wait for a trigger it's called a zero day and that is it the malware gets in there undetected sits and waits for the right moment and my understanding is that right now like for example for the um for stuxnet the attack on the iranian uh uh what do you call it nuclear program that Stuxnet had to get into all of the machines and then wait until basically it was all there and they were all infected because they had to get to the right machines and get infected and then that there would be some sort of triggering event that caused them all to make the centrifuges go too fast. So the machines were all infected long before the program was triggered. So my understanding of what some ordinary gamer is saying in the totality of his 20 minute video is what's happening right now is all of the mal malware is getting in place. And there's a flurry of activity of the malware going places. It hasn't done anything yet, but it will. Everything's getting infected right now. The machines are getting infected and they'll be actually sick, if you will, at some point in the future, we don't know when. So he says the cyber war is already happening and some of, it's some of the worst stuff that you'll ever see. So that is my understanding of what he is saying. Correct me if you think he's saying something else. Let's watch a little bit of it. In the last few days, we've literally seen the- Oh, incidentally, one more thing. This is from March 5th. So this is about two weeks ago, but I think it's still, I think it's still valid. It's still timely. All right, let's watch it again. In the last few days, we've literally seen the worst kinds of malware just being thrown around as if it's nothing. Think of it like digital nuclear weapons just constantly being tossed around within each digital precise strikes against big giant threat actors. And of course, now that these tools are even more out in the wild and the scales have escalated, if you will, the people that are more interested in me and you now have a new set of tools to play around and work with. And it's something that we all should be a little bit weary of and it's something we all should be very much focusing on as time goes on.
The only thing scarier than getting hacked is the potential for critical infrastructure to unfortunately be hit. And if you're one of those people that works in these cybersecurity offices for a lot of these like critical infrastructure organizations, you already know what I'm talking about. You already know to be extra goddamn vigilant. But that said, though, ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and I just wanted to talk about how the greatest cyber war is going on right now as we speak. So I agree, disagree. He's saying the cyber war is already going on. We're, we're in the middle of it. We just haven't felt the effects of it yet. Is that true? Is it not true? I don't know. Uh, I'm not a computer expert, so we may find out, I may find out the same time as the rest of the population whether this is actually true or not. Um, okay, excuse me. Jason Carter says the cyber war, the cyber war is I spent 48 of 60 days banned from Facebook just for being me. Well, you, you kind of deserve it just for being you. I mean, between you and me, I mean, we both know, right? Super Soda Jerk says, my biggest question is, <laughs> is there going to be zombies anytime? Depends on your definition of zombie, because I've been to the DMV, and there's some zombies working there. There's people moving around who just seem to be completely bra brainless. They don't seem to want to eat brains, though. I think that that's the only difference between, like, the mythical zombie and the actual ones that work at the DMV, is they don't actually eat brains. Mark Alfie, and everybody's kind of, <laughs> looks like people are sort of saying exactly what I just said. We have zombies already, haha. <laughs> Over here on Entropy, I guess I'm not the first one to, to make that joke, huh? Uh, Elkman says, the scariest thing is the reports Russia is not encrypting its radio traffic and even relying on phones. That is third world military failure bad. I, this is what I think is, is going on. Let's presume, for the sake of argument, that the military stuff that they're sending right now it has a, a lot to be desired. Um, for example, they're sending conscripts. We know they have better trained soldiers. Uh, I showed you some video of some very, very old equipment that, that was being used. We know they have more equipment. They're, they're spending, they have a budget that can do these hypersonic missiles, which we don't have. So they aren't spending as much money on their military as we are, but they've still got better stuff than what they're using. Are they just trying stuff out and seeing how much little, how little they can spend on Ukraine? Like, let's try this out. And we don't want to spend too much of our resources on this, but if we can't get it with these minimal resources, we'll increase the resources that we spend. I, I don't know. There's a lot of unknowns going on right now. But the fact of the matter is they are doing, they're, they're taking over Ukraine. The mainstream media wants us to believe that they're failing at every turn, and yet Zelensky is begging for help. If they're doing so well, why is Zelensky begging for help? So it, it just doesn't, there's a lot of things that don't make sense on their face. All these million, they're, they're giving weapons to civilians to protect themselves because the military can't pr uh, protect them. And yet we're supposed to believe that the Ukrainian military is just trouncing over the Russians. It doesn't make sense on its face. So I would tend to believe that the Russians are making errors. There's, some, there's definitely incompetence. My life experience is that incompetence abounds in every country and every organization, but they are doing a lot better than the mainstream media is leading us to believe. Elkman says, I understand Russia's uh, logistics is heavily reliant on their train network internally. However, outside of friendly territory, they have to use trucks, making them more dependent on roads. Uh, Alan Harry's cyber war, is that like social media shutting down channels that don't go along with the narrative? LOL. <laughs> yep. Uh, Tom, Tom, it's not just Russia versus Ukraine. You have militias from the Donetsk and Luhansk republics who have done the heavy lifting in the east. Meanwhile, the Chechens were sent to Mariupol. There's a lot going on. Uh, <clears throat> Doesn't matter, says that stuff they want you to know it's an info op. It's just it's it, like, as I said earlier, it's hard to know what the truth is. It's hard to know what they're telling us that isn't true. It's hard to know what is true that they're not telling us. 
where do we get the good information? There's, there's no answer to that. Burns says, but Russia does need the city of Nikolev as Ukraine's major shipbuilding infrastructure is located there and Russia needs that for building new large surface combatants. Again, okay. Burns says there are 81 million zombies. There's more than that. There's more than that. There's a lot of zombies. Alrighty, let's jump back to stories that we've got and uh, Germany. I had heard that Russia cut Germany off, has cut them off already. I have not been able to find anything to confirm that, and I looked. I looked for something that said Germany has officially been completely cut off from natural gas from Russia. I couldn't find anything that says that. My, as far as I can tell from the research that I did today, this is March 21st because uh, it's from, it's an Australian news source, and if I got it this afternoon, then it was already tomorrow over there. Uh, everything that I found indicated that they are still getting natural gas from Russia, that it hasn't ended, and Germany, it's possible in the future that Russia will cut it off, but Germany has no plans to cut it off because they can't. This is an article from the Canberra Times. Germany steps closer to Putin-free energy. Germany and Qatar have agreed upon a long-term energy partnership. I saw another source that called it medium term. A step towards providing Germany with Putin-free energy, German economic minister Robert Habeck says. Habeck's comments came after a meeting with Qatari Emir Tamim bin Hamad al Tani, I hope I never had to say that again, part of a two-nation tour the minister is conducting in light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Europe's desire to distance themselves from Russia. The day has developed a strong dynamic, said Habeck. Although we might still need Russian gas this year. So they just come out and admit it. We need it. We need the natural gas. Although we might still need Russian gas this year, in the future it won't be so anymore, and this is only the start. Uh, I read another source that said they're looking at maybe five years from now being able to live without Russian natural, natural gas. It's, they need it, and they don't have another place to get their energy. If they start doing all of their alternative energy stuff, I think they put too much faith in that. But even with all of those efforts and all of those, that faith in the alternative energy sources, they're still predicting five years. Russia has until now provided 55% of Germany, Germany's fossil fuel imports. I think they get some locally. I think um, I, they rely 40% of their energy is from, from Russia. It was in the middle of finalizing an internationally condemned pipeline from Russia when Moscow began threatening Ukraine. So that, that pipeline, which hasn't been finished that's stopped but the other pipelines where they're getting natural gas from my understanding is they're, they're still flowing but that has all changed since february 24th Hayback has also warned germans it could take time which is why germany has refused to turn off the taps to russian gas and oil for now but russia might do it <laughs> especially if russia finds other places to sell its fossil fuels to, such as India. Russian oil sale to India complicates Biden's efforts. You see, I, I, Germany seems to think that they're the only potential buyers here. There are other potential buyers in the rest of the world who are willing to buy the Russian fossil fuels. Or Russia, I don't know, they might be able to just not sell any for a little while. President Joe Biden's campaign to unite the globe against the Russian invasion of Ukraine is being challenged not only by adversaries such as China, but also the world's most populous democracy, India. An Indian government official said Friday that the country will increase its imports of Russian oil, allowing it to boost energy supplies at a discount as its economy struggles to recover, recover from the coronavirus pandemic. The official, who was not authorized to talk to reporters and spoke on the condition of anonymity, said the latest purchase was 3 million barrels. 
which is a fraction of what the U.S. uses. Although India isn't alone in buying Russian energy, several European allies such as Germany have continued to do so. They have no choice. The decision conflicts with Biden's efforts to isolate Russia's economy with sanctions. The increased flow of oil could further strain the relationship between Washington and New Delhi, which has already been tested by India's recent procurement of advanced Russian air defense systems. The White House is still considering whether to enact sanctions on India for that purchase. That would be so dumb. That would be so dumb to put sanctions on India. India is massive. Well, this is right now alienating the, uh, is India now more populous than China? They are, I think it's still, China's still ahead, but India is a close second. Alienating India, China, and Russia all at the same time would just be, I don't think we can handle it. I don't think the world economy can handle that. In the middle of everything else, now you want to piss off India. Why? There's no reason, there's no benefit to making an enemy of India. The issue is being looked at with a different spin following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, according to a U.S. official familiar with the Biden administration's deliberations. So India, I mean, again, like the, the oil's being offered at a discount. And if I were India, I'd be like, all right, we'll buy it. We'll, we'll buy the oil. We don't care about Ukraine. We'll buy the oil. And even if they do care about Ukraine, they need the oil. They need the oil. Um, India has poverty issues. They need to get things a little bit less expensive. Uh, and also, they need the fertilizer. They were working on a deal with Russia for to import more fertilizer from Russia prior to the Ukrainian war starting. Now they're scrambling, trying to buy it from other places. I think in the end, they're just going to come back to Russia. They need the fertilizer. They've got to have it. It's the same as Russia, or sorry, Germany needing the oil. India's got to have the fertilizer. So the whole idea of that we're going to do sanctions and, and all of our allies are going to do sanctions too. Russia's too big. We can't, the whole world can't live without the Russian oil and the Russian fertilizer. All right, let's look at some of the comments that we've got here. Over here on Entropy, uh, $3 for mandatory carry. Hashtag keep fighting. Thank you so much. No get home back. <clears throat> and uh, there are four lights. Are there four lights? There are four lights. My daughter took her get home bag, her, her bug out bag. It's not a get home bag. It's a, it's a bug out bag. I got her to take that with her when she left last week. It was so sad when she left. Um, that was early Monday morning. Man, I was tired after that. Let's look at a couple of comments we got here. James McDaniel, Putin had planned to declare the complete <clears throat> and indisputable military victory of Russian troops on the evening of Sunday, 27th of February, announced the end of the so-called special operation, Valerie. I find that hard to believe. And Putin's not an idiot. He had to have known that it would take a little bit longer to do it. As, as I said before, it took the United States about a month to take over Iraq. I, it's just not credible to me that Putin thought it would take a couple of days. I, I just don't find that, I find that one difficult to believe. It, that doesn't mean it's impossible he thought that, I just think that it's unlikely. Uh, <clears throat> Tom Tom says Russia might demand that Germany purchase gas from Russia in rubles, maybe even with gold, if they want, if they want it this fall. See, it's, it's the end of winter right now. Germany still needs the liquid natural gas to cook with. They use it for other things besides heating. They still need it to cook with and stuff. But uh, they have bought themselves a little time because it's not. Ne it's only next winter where it's going to be much more life and death. This doesn't. It gives them a little bit of time, but not a whole hell of a lot. They've got what ten months before it starts getting super cold again. That's not a lot of time for them to replace forty percent of their. Uh, fossil fuel use. Where are we? <laughs> Altman says, it's almost like the world economy is in interconnected. Yep. Back here on YouTube, Bob's wife is super late today. Yep. Faithless, moral posturing will not feed and power your nation. Exactly. It, India needs to feed its people. They're going to have to get the fertilizer from Russia. Fiery Waco says, it's not hard to make fertilizer. I just, it just can be cheaper to do it overseas. Um, 
I'm not a fertilizer expert. I, I'm not so sure that I agree with whether or not it's hard to make fertilizer. Uh, yeah, I, I just don't know. Faithless says people projecting their own moronic assumptions onto Putin's thinking and calling him the fool. <laughs> Uh, Super Soda Jerk, Tazzy, you're spot on this intentional. You're spot on this. Oh, you're talking to Tazzy. There is no way these stupid decisions are incompetence. This is intentional sabotage of the Western world. Uh, I don't know. The Putin, Putin is, I'm not Putin, Biden is um, pretty dumb. Do we have any moderators? It might be a good time for a moderator to, I don't think we have any on here right now. Ah. None of my moderators are here. Okay, who wants to be a moderator? Kyle Glenn, do you want to be a moderator? Let me know if you want to. <laughs> TNT Cycle says, I make fertilizer every day. I can't. I don't have time to go through this and get rid of those. So who wants to be a moderator? Just put your, put your, um, tell me in the chat if you want to be the one to do it. Alan Harry says, UK says it will stop buying gas from Russia by the end of the year. Russia made a deal to sell China gas for 30 years. The UK is in a little bit of a better position here because they do have oil uh, on the um, uh, the North Sea. North sea. Fiery Wago says, just pick some people and make them moderators. All right. You are... All right. All right, Fiery Wago, take care of that for me. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> okay okay let's go to the next story which is okay Saudi Arabia and has been cozying up to China I really liked this take on it from the uh, Indian channel that I, the Indian news channel that I look at sometimes they called we on and uh, they described how Saudi Arabia is sort of sick of the United States and is looking for new customers and China looks like it might be a good customer. Reports say Riyadh has invited Xi Jinping for a state visit. If true, this could change the politics of West Asia. For starters, Xi Jinping has not left China in two years. So this will be quite a visit. He's been shut away from the public. If he picks Riyadh to end that streak, it would be symbolic. Secondly, the timing of this invite. Saudi Arabia and the US are not on good terms. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is not answering Joe Biden's calls. He's refused to increase oil production as America demanded or requested. So this visit, Xi Jinping's visit to Riyadh, would be a clear message to Washington DC. Saudi Arabia has other options and it's not afraid to explore them. Now, what do we know about this trip? It could happen after the holy month of Ramadan, so possibly in the month of May. Parallels are being drawn to 2017. That's when Donald Trump <coughs> visited Riyadh for his first foreign trip. He was given a grand welcome by the Saudis. Something similar awaits Xi Jinping, perhaps. But 2017 was all about rebuilding an old relationship. This one is about building a new one. How will it change West Asian politics? And what's in it for both sides? Let's discuss the power equations first. Since the last century, America has been the biggest military power in West Asia. Iran needed relief from sanctions. China needed oil. So both sides signed a 25-year economic agreement. At the same time, Beijing reached out to Iran's rivals, to Israel, to the UAE, to Saudi Arabia. They funded economic projects in West Asia. They offered to sell weapons. And most importantly, they offered something America could not, a market for their oil. You see, the US is energy independent now. <coughs> they have their own oil. They don't need West Asian oil anymore. In fact, America is the biggest oil producer in the world. On the other hand, China does need oil. It is the biggest energy consumer in the world. So put yourself in Saudi Arabia's shoes. Do you need a customer or a reluctant friend who lectures you? I like how she said that. Do you need a customer or a reluctant friend who lectures you? And yeah, because uh, the lefties, when they get in charge, they'll go over and say, we don't like your human rights history. Uh, it, completely ignoring any uh, human rights issues of our own in the U.S. They don't need somebody who's going to lecture them. They're not in it to impress the moral values of the United States. They just want to sell the oil. They just, they just want to sell the freaking oil. 
and I can understand how they, they've lost their patience with the U.S. and they're like, we'll just sell our oil someplace else. You want to you wanna buy our oil? Come buy our oil. But, but shut up. Shut up. We, we've got our own uh, domestic issues and they're none of your damn business. She's got a point. The, uh, the, the analyst there. She's got a point with all of that. I disagree. Well, I mean, I agree and disagree with one of the things that she said. She said the United States energy independent. I mean, yes, we produce enough oil to satisfy our own market. The thing is that uh, a lot of the oil isn't staying here. It is being sold overseas and the companies can get a price, better price overseas. So not everything that we're producing is staying here which means that um, the price is still going to be affected by the international markets. If the companies could sell it for more abroad, our prices are going to go up. Otherwise, they'll just sell it someplace else. So we are still seeing increases in the oil prices. Uh, and before I get onto some of these questions, let me look over here. There was another, oh yeah, Saudi Arabia may begin to sell its oil to China in Chinese currency instead of in U.S. dollars. This is something they've actually been discussing for many years. When I was researching this, I found articles saying in 2017 that they were going to start selling the oil in yuans but they didn't. So are they going to do it now? They've been talking about it for a long time. They've been threatening to do it. This might be the time when they actually do it. Saudi Arabia has clearly wanted to do it for a while. Then they just might take the dive because of everything that's going on. A lot of what's going on in the world right now are things that have kind of been in the works and have been threatening to happen for a long time. And right now they actually the dominoes are falling. So this isn't something that people just thought of the other day. It's something that has been possible for a while, but now it may actually occur. Saudi Arabia is considering the Chinese yuan to price some of its oil transactions rather than the predominantly used U.S. dollar. Around 80% of global oil sales are conducted in U.S. dollars, but that level of dominance may not last. With talks about currency shakeup between Gulf nations and their counterparts in China, which buys more than 25% of Saudi Arabia's oil. That would mark a significant change for the Saudis, who have been trading oil exclusively in U.S. dollars for decades. Talks about yuan priced oil contracts between the two countries have been on and off for the past six years, but have become increasingly frequent since Saudi, Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia's relationship with the U.S. has become increasingly strained. Uh, additionally, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have said they are concerned about the U.S. taking part in talks geared towards reviving the Iran nuclear deal. That dynamics have dramatically changed, a Saudi official told the Wall Street Journal. The U.S. relationship has changed. China is the world's biggest crude importer, and they are offering many lucrative incentives to the kingdom. So this is, if this happens, this may damage the value of the U.S. dollar. One of the things that's kept the dollar afloat and has enabled the United States to just print more money is that everybody has to trade in the U.S. dollar when they want to buy oil, especially. Uh, so if they're starting to trade it in yuans, that could threaten the U.S petrodollar and reduce the value of the dollar. That means that any imports we have will have to pay more for and it will contribute to inflation. Um, of course, when we send stuff abroad, we get more money for it, but <laughs> we just don't produce that much anymore. So I don't know how much we're going to be selling. Uh, one more bit on the oil. No, maybe I'll wait on that because I've got two stories that go together there. Let's look at some of the comments that we've got. Derek Fish says, Laurel, are you from Michigan? No, I am from New Jersey. I am from New Jersey. I was born there and raised there. But my family, we, we just move around a lot. Uh, I've been learning a lot more of the history of my ethnic group. Uh, I've got a hold of a book called um, Albion's Seed, and just it's been an eye opener. I'm a little frustrated that I didn't learn more about this sooner, but we just move around a lot, and we don't really stay in one place. 
My father was from California. My mother was from New Mexico. I've moved around a lot. I grew up in New Jersey. I went to college in Massachusetts. I did grad school in North Carolina and then uh, law school in Pennsylvania. I lived in Houston for 13 years and I just lived in New Hampshire for three years recently and now I live here. We just always move around a lot and all of my, my family is the same way. So even though I'm from New Jersey, my family's not and none of my family lives there now and i think that's significant too i have five sisters none of them live in new jersey and my mother's moved out from there so even though i was born there and raised there i don't have any family in new jersey anymore despite the size of my family okay let's get back to this uh granite state man says the west is stupid with the esg scores and globalist great reset bs yes i agree uh, reason is so so the petrodollar is dead looks like that's happening not yet but very soon that's what it looks like Derek fish it may it will crush us mm -hmm. black magic if you thought we had fiat currency before the petrodollar collapses just wait till after it's replaced oh yeah I agree that's why um, inflation is gonna get a lot worse and uh, just keep that in mind when you're making your planning decisions. John A says, compost is a good fertilizer and most cities have compost bins along with recycling and trash. We could commercialize it and sell it. Um, I'm afraid that in India they would start composting if they couldn't buy, sorry, the fertilizing. If they couldn't buy commercial fertilizer, they may start composting with human waste if people get desperate. Uh, out in the country and if they start doing that it will spread disease you have to be really careful with that especially if they haven't done it in a long time there's ways that you can compost human waste so that when you put it on your plants it's not dangerous do they know how to do that maybe hundreds of years ago they knew how to do that but in recent history not to, and i'm not just talking about india like in the u.s a lot of old farming techniques not even like I'm talking about farming techniques from like 50, 100 years ago have been forgotten because everybody has to use these modern farming techniques. And when I say have to, you know, unless you're a tiny organic farm, if you're any kind of commercial farmer, you're basically required to use these uh, new techniques. You're required to use the GMO seeds and you have to use the, the fertilizer and you have to use the pesticides. You basically have to use all this stuff. So people don't even know how to save seeds anymore. They don't know how to farm without all of those chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And that's how it is in the US. I'm sure there's a lot of similar stuff going on in India where people, there's a set of knowledge that's been lost. They've been purchasing the chemical fertilizers. Do they know how to do it the old way anymore? I don't know. Okay, uh, Altman says a lot of U.S. oil is sold overseas because many plants are set to process sour and not the sweet crude oil produced in large amount in the U.S. because the plants were major investments before fracking. I didn't quite understand that, but I will say, okay, I should just act like I understand it. Uh, Rusinus says Laurel is the rootless non-elite. Pretty much, I mean, basically I'm American. I, we, we just, we move around a lot. And the people in my ethnic group, we, we usually describe ourselves as American. It's just with these new uh, DNA tests that I'm like, oh, Scottish and English. Um, I kind of knew that, but still, it's interesting to, um, to see it. We usually refer to ourselves as Americans. We move around a lot. Um, all right. Let's go on to the next story, which is, where am I? Oh, this is along the same lines. A... The Biden administration is releasing another 30 million barrels from its strategic reserve. I covered a story a couple months ago that says the U.S. was releasing 50 million barrels from its strategic reserve, and that was actually before this, this war with Ukraine. <clears throat> it looked like a way to bring down the price of gas when they did the 50 million a couple of months ago, bring down the price of gas and also generate a little bit of revenue for the federal government. They're kind of doing the same thing now 
I think the Biden administration is desperate to bring down the price of oil because it was starting to rise uncontrollably and people were getting pissed off. You may have noticed just in the past week or so that the price came down a little bit. It had gotten up to like four, locally where I am, it had gotten up to like 420 a gallon. It's back down to like 389 a gallon, which is which is better for when you're buying it, but um, you can't keep doing that. You can't keep just releasing oil from the strategic reserve. Right now, the strategic reserve, it has a total capacity. What's the total capacity? I saw it here a bit. Okay, the total capacity is 727 million barrels. Right now, it's down to 577 million barrels and we use about 20 million barrels of crude oil a day. Now, it's not like we're just gonna use oil from the strategic reserve and not produce anything else. So we're not gonna run out of strategic oil in like a month because we're, we're still otherwise producing. But we don't, because we sell some abroad and you just can't keep flooding the market with oil from the strategic reserve indefinitely. It will run out and it, it won't even take that long. I think it'll take more than a month. But if you do it like this, it could be six months and then what? So we kind of need to hang on to that strategic reserve. I think it's a little short-sighted of the Biden administration. I think they're just, I don't think they have a plan. I think they're just going day by day and trying to get through the, to the next day. I don't think they have a plan to solve this problem. So another 30 mil, million barrels has been sold and we only have 577 million barrels left. Well, it says as of March 4th. So is that before the sale? That may be before the sale, in which case we'd have like 547 million barrels left. It, that's fine if you don't, sell it if you hang on to it but i expect that's going to continue uh that attempt to bring down the price of oil you know it's it's going to be fleeting the price of oil is going to go back up because that that 30 million barrels is going to get used up and then oil is going to go back up and the price of gas affects the price of everything because everything has to be transported inflation is continuing to go up and up and up there were some really good charts in this article. The article also had uh, had uh, paragraphs and stuff, but I wanted to look at just the charts on this. This is from Business Insider. Inflation is getting worse for the goods and services America need, Americans need the most. So the official inflation rate as of February was 7.8%, almost 8%. That's the official rate but when they give that official inflation rate like they exclude a lot of necessities they exclude fuel housing and food the, the things we actually have to buy which is just it's just crazy so these are some of the shirts charts showing the the different inflation rates for different things that we actually need to buy you look at this um for transportation gasoline has just been going up like crazy at the beginning of the pandemic between january of 2020 and uh end of april in 2020 it actually went down a lot and that's because putin flooded the market with extra oil i think he knew exactly what he was doing he knew it was going to make things look worse when everything had to climb back up again and also it caused a lot of um, industry oil producing industry in the u.s to shut down very smart he was planning ahead he knew what he was doing but uh, even it, like the price of oil went back to the pre-pandemic levels early in 2021 and has since continued to rise. And it is now rising at an astronomical rate of like 35%. It's to, as I said, it's temporarily gone down, but it's going to go back up. It's going up at like 30%. For new cars and trucks, this has a lot to do with the the um, shortage of the the microchips new cars and trucks are selling for 15 percent more than they were pre-pandemic and then motor vehicle insurance is now going up slightly because uh, i don't know why <laughs> i guess just because everything else is going up but you can see 15 percent more for so if you want to buy a car 
if you can find one, if you can get one. I think a lot of people, they see that the price has gone up so much and they're putting off buying a new car. You can't put it off forever. Eventually your car is going to break down and it has to be replaced. Uh, housing and utilities. The utilities, especially natural gas, have, has gone up over 30% since pre-pandemic. Electricity is up like 12%. Rent is up about six or seven percent just over the past two years this this is a lot it's going up very very dramatically for food for milk we're at 14 percent food at home like 13 percent bread and that's going to go up a lot because the wheat shortage that's 10 percent these i mean these numbers these are things you have to buy you you have to buy food <clears throat> unless you grow it all in your garden which i as i recommended at the start of the show um the inflation rate being at around 8%, that is not a reflection of reality. If our food and our gas, our, our gas is up 30% and our food is up 12.5%. Health, this is the one area which, which hasn't gone up that much. Health is only up for hospital services, about 6%. Medical care services, about 6%. So that's actually slightly lower than the inflation rate. Um, and medicine has actually gone down, which is very interesting. I'm not really sure why. So inflation for things we actually need, the things you can't put off buying, things you actually have to buy, is in the double digits, uh, which I haven't seen since I was a little kid. Over here on Entropy, Black Magic, $5, thank you. Who do you think came up with the brilliant idea of excluding food, fuel, and housing from inflation? I don't know for sure, but it's something, but something's telling me it rhymes with shoes. I'm sure it was the muse. Alan Harry's in UK, we had oil reserves until Theresa May sold them. We've had some bad prime ministers. Yep. Uh... <laughs> James McDaniel quote American race yeah I think um, there I, I don't want to get into it right now but I see why the people in the Scottish English ethnic group like this very particular group of people that uh, inhabited the border between England and Scotland for a long time and there were uh, wars going on between them eventually they moved and went to the Appalachian Mountains and subsequently became the pioneers going across the US they were the ones really wanting to call themselves American and not anything else. And I think part of it is they wanted to put that war behind them, especially since they had sort of immigrated as a group, even though they had been warring with each other for a long time. So they, I think they were anxious to put the past in the past, move forward. We're no longer British. We're American. So I think the fact that I don't know that history it's because of my own ethnic group that I don't know my ethnic group's history. Like that was a conscious decision that um, was made for the best of reasons, but it's kind of caused us to not know our own history, which is, which is a shame. I'm glad I found that book. Um, Super Soda Jerk, I need something with fuel economy, but still fast enough to run away from the hordes of the Mad Max gangs wanting my fuel. <laughs> Rush of wrong thing. I have missed almost the entire show. How goes it, peeps? Owl, is this the death of the free world? How's the death of the free world treating y'all today? Good, I'm fine. A fiery Waco, you don't need insurance for a mule. Just saying. <laughs> we pretty much just stay here. We're, we're, well, I mean, someday we have to go get my stepson. There. Oh, by the way, before I forget, I'll, I'll mention it at the end of the show. I'm not doing a show... I don't think I'm going to be able to do the show next week because we are going away for the weekend with my stepson and we're going to have a really good time and I'll be back by evening because we have to hand him back to his mother at 6 p.m. anyway, but I won't have time to prep. So if I were going to do a show, it would just be off the cuff. Why don't you guys tell me, do you want me to do just, and I would, might do like a little short one. Maybe we can do half an hour or an hour where we just sit and chat, but I really wouldn't have time to prep because we're not going to get back until like four or five and it's not going to be enough time for me to prep a show. So let me know if you want me to do just sort of an off the cuff show where we sit and we chat about stuff or should I just take the week off next weekend? Tell me what you think. 
Rodzilla says I work in groceries and the number they give us is BX, BS. A box of corn dogs has gone from $6.99 to $12.47 in the past year. Wow, meat has skyrocketed as well. It's more like 20% jumps every month. Yep, yep. <laughs> Rational Wrong think I want a t-shirt with let them eat lentils on it. Let me tell you, every time when my whenever my daughter comes to visit, Matt says, she has to make doll because my daughter makes doll. She has this Af Afghani cookbook and she makes it and it's so good. So she's like, can she make the doll? They're just, they're really good. And it's almost completely lentils. It's lentils and spices. And it's really, really good. Tazzy says, yep. Any show is better than no show. Okay. Um, Mary Smith says, I'd love to see y'all next Sunday. Uh, Beaver Wood Wood Works do and ask me anything show. Um, Granite State Man wants a call-in show. Uh, there's been uh, technical problems trying to do call-in. Uh, I can see if I can work out. I don't really know what the issues are that need to be worked out. I just know that when people were trying to connect on Discord, I couldn't hear them. So I can hear some people and not others. I'm not really sure what the issue is. I can look into it and we can d think about a call-in show, but no promises on that one. Faithless says you could just scroll through a news feed and read, learn, and react as you go. That's a possibility. Black Magic says maybe Uncle A could be off screen and you could do a chill back and forth. Maybe, maybe Bob's wife love to have a chat show. We shall see. I will think about it. Maybe I'll, I will, uh, I'm out of focus again. Maybe I will plan on doing a show without any prep uh, and I we'll decide over the course of the week whether we will try to do a call-in show. Um, that did not get in focus. I will try to decide over the week whether um, it will be a call-in show or or what we're going to do. But okay, let's, let's plan on having a show next week regardless. All right, so uh, I want to talk about China for a little bit. Now, back in December, we're going to go back in time here, I did a segment predicting, it was, uh, it was actually Ford Observer's prediction, but explaining what that prediction is of how China would go about surrounding Taiwan, taking over a number of the islands in the South Pacific, or sorry, the South China Sea, and, and then do a blockade to prevent Taiwan from receiving any goods. There have been some updates in what's going on, but first let me do a little recap because when I did it back in December, when I talked about this back in December, and I was wearing the same shirt. I, I like the shirt a lot, I like the color. When I did this back in December, I had some really great maps. So um, I think I'm just going to show you the recap of what I said back then. What China might do is take Japan's Senkaku Islands, which is they're in this circle, the pink circle that I have on top, and take Taiwan's Pratis Island, which is to the south of Taiwan. It's the third little circle that I have from top to bottom. So they don't have those islands right now, but China could come along and take those islands. Uh, I zoomed in on the map. I wanted to use this one because it's clear what's going on regionally, but I zoomed in on the map and we're talking about really, really tiny islands. They're very small. And if China invades those islands, it's going to be very difficult for other governments to say, let's go to war over this tiny piece of dirt in the middle of the ocean. They're very strategic islands but it's going to be difficult to sell this to the people of Taiwan or the United States or, or what have you, that we need to go sacrifice the lives of our people or put them in danger so we can get back this teeny tiny island in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, it is, it's a pretty good strategy. If they can get those islands, they also own, they already own, the Parcel Islands and the Spratly Islands, um, and those are the, the, the next two circles. So we've got five circles over here on the top. Those are the Senkaku Islands, there's Taiwan, there's the Pratis Islands, the Parcel Islands, and the Spratly Islands. If China takes those four sets of islands, 
Senkaku Pradas and still has Parcel and Spratly. They are set up for an embargo against Taiwan. It, they're not, you know, it doesn't look like, well, Taiwan's not completely surrounded. There's not much to the, the east. Well, it's just ocean. <laughs> the goods are coming from the south. The goods are mostly coming through the Strait of Malacca. That's that oval-shaped oval pink circle that I have down at the bottom. The Strait of Malacca is where a lot of the goods coming from the west are going to come through. And that's going to be anything from Europe. Uh, yeah, stuff from the United States can come in through the Pacific Ocean. But that Strait of Malacca is... There's like a huge, huge amount of goods coming through there. So if it goes through the Strait of Malacca, it's the goods are want the ships are going to want to come up through all of those islands. Which if China has a bunch of uh, military, navy, etc., on all of those islands, then they can create an embargo. Okay, so a couple of the updates. One of them is the Senkaku Islands which are the Japanese islands just north of Taiwan. Apparently Japan and the US are getting a lot more concerned that China is, is eyeing them. There have just recently been the first ever combat drills between the US and Japan. This is from the Epic Times. Japan and U.S. Marines conduct first joint combat drills amid China and Russia threats. Japanese and U.S. Marines conducted their first airborne landing <clears throat> and combat drills together on Tuesday, indicating a deepening of military cooperation in the wake of increased military assertiveness by China and Russia. The drills held near Mount Fuji were part of a three-week joint exercise which involved about 400 troops from Japan's Amphibious Rapid Development Brigade and 600, 600 troops from the U.S. Marines based in Okinawa. Tilt rotor Ospreys transported the brigade during the drills. The drills came as Japan intensified its pressure on Beijing over its claim to vast swaths of the South China Sea. China has built up its military presence in the South China Sea and made numerous incursions into the East China Sea where the Senkaku Islands are located. Japan has mostly administered the Senkaku Islands since 1895, but Beijing began asserting its right over the islands in the 1970s and called them the Diaoyu Islands. Russia's maritime activity is likewise increasing as its cooperation, as is its cooperation with China. Japan's Navy detected six Russian Navy vessels passing through the Soya Strait, which separates Japan's northern island, island off island of Hokkaido and Russia's Sakhalin Island on midnight on Sunday. So you can see what I've underlined here. They are specifically looking at the Senkaku Islands. That is where China has been making incursions. And that seems to be one of the reasons why these drills are now being conducted. That would be the mark of China is trying to, is taking action to take over Taiwan is if they go after the Senkaku Islands. And as I said in December, if that happens, Japan would have a very hard time convincing the Japanese people that they need to go to war with China over this tiny little island. I think uh, people in Japan are going to be like, fuck the tiny little island, fuck Taiwan, we don't want to war with China. People in Japan would say that. So uh, they're making the overtures and we'll see, and, the, and this article is just from a couple of days ago, that the Chinese are making incursions over there. Also, the Spratly Islands. I keep wanting to call them the Spraddle Islands. Spraddle, Spratly. The Spratly Islands, a, a U.S. Oh, Indo-Pacific commander says, I think he's a U.S. official, though. Yeah, there we go. Um, the islands, the Spratly Islands are now fully militarized. This article is just, it's from today. China has fully militarized isles, Indo-Pacific commander says. This is from the Associated Press. China has fully militarized at least three of several islands it built in the disputed South China Sea, 
arming them with anti-ship and anti-aircraft missile, missile systems, laser and jamming equipment, and fighter jets in an increasingly aggressive move that threatens all nations operating nearby, a top U.S. military command said Sunday. So the Spratly Islands were the southernmost islands that I circled in that recap. They are of the islands that I circled. They're the closest to the Strait of Malacca. So they already have that. Like that belongs to China. They actually built the islands. Um, if they have that and then they have the Senkaku Islands, if they take those from Japan, then they've got the two ends. I think they also already have the Parasol Islands. So the only ones after that that they would go after would be those other ones that are just next to Taiwan. And I think that's the moment. I don't think Japan will get into a war over the Senkaku Islands, but if they try to take that other island that belongs to Taiwan, then, then it might be on. But this, this article is about how they've built up their military presence on those Spratly Islands. They've been doing it for a while, but it looks like they're, they're increasing it now. Getting ready for what? U.S. Indo-Pacific Commander Adam John Aquilino, Aquilino said the hostile actions were being in stark co contrast to Chinese President Xi Jinping's past assurances that Beijing would not transform the artificial islands in contested waters into military bases. The efforts were part of China's flexing its military muscle, he said. I think over the past 20 years, we've witnessed the largest military buildup since World War II by the People's Republic of China. Uh, they have advanced all their capabilities and that buildup of weaponization is destabilizing the region. This is one of their, their man-made islands. Uh, Aquilino spoke with the Associated Press on board a U.S. Navy reconnaissance aircraft that flew near Chinese-held outposts in the South China Sea's Spratly Archipelago, one of the most hotly contested regions in the world. During the patrol, the P-8A Poseidon plane was repeatedly warned by Chinese callers that it illegally entered what they said was China's territory and ordered the plane to move away. China has sovereignty over the Spratly Islands as well as surrounding maritime areas. Stay away immediately to avoid misjudgment, one of the stern radio messages said in a veiled threat. So this is, um, it just seems to be military stuff that they've put on the, this island and it is completely, completely militarized at this point. So stuff is definitely afoot over in the South China Sea. It's 841. I'm going to do my last video and then we will we will chat about it. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about today is there is increased, there was a, sort of a cartel war going on along the, the southern border of the U.S. such that uh, it caused the U.S. consulate to close down and there were even some grenades going off right by the consulate. I don't think the consulate was the target. I think the cartels just didn't care that it was there. And uh, one of the experts that they spoke to is actually a congressman, U.S. congressman near that region because it's right along the border. And he said that what happened was um, one of the cartel leaders was arrested and then they had, so they were mad. So that cartel was angry and fighting and then there's other cartels that see a power vacuum when that one is now gone or their leader is gone and they they're competing to see who's going to take that guy's place and that's what this war was or this outbreak of fighting was all about the sounds of gunfire piercing the night in nuevo laredo gang members paralyzing traffic with spike strips charred tractor trailers lining the highway. We saw some of the destruction of 18 wheelers, vehicles uh, along the pathway. Congressman uh, Henry Cuellar from Laredo, Texas, says the violence was sparked over a high profile cartel arrest. One group is not happy because they caught their leader. The other two are saying, hmm, is there a vacuum in here? Maybe we need to come in. 
So there might be fights over uh, Plaza because of what happened capturing that high-ranking individual. The man arrested, one of Border Patrol's most wanted criminals, Juan Gerardo Trevino, also known as El Huevo. He's the leader of the cartel of the Northeast with a long rap sheet. His arrest, a powerful blow to that gang's power in the area. Now, two other cartels are vying for their business. Three gangs taking to the streets, firing at Mexican troops and each other shutting down the U.S. consulate and two international bridges in the process. All of this on the same day Governor Greg Abbott appointed a new leader to run the Texas National Guard. General Thomas Seltzer is replacing General Tracy Norris, who had been in charge of the Texas Military Department for three years and the embattled Operation Lone Star <clears throat> since its inception. What we do know is that the results that we've seen on the border have been difficult living conditions for soldiers, endemic pay problems, lack of key equipment. Davis Winky is a reporter with the Army Times who first broke operational problems with Operation Lone Star. A press release from Governor Abbott about the change hinted it was because General Norris' term was up. Winky believes there's probably more to the story. Yes, Norris's two-year appointment had expired, but her predecessor did seven years. <sighs> So that war is going on right along our border, um, but we're sending troops not to our border, where we have a war. We're sending our troops overseas to deal with other stuff. That, that whole battle with the cartels and stuff, that's spilling over into the United States. And we need to be very, very wary of what is going on with those cartels. All right, let's look at comments and we're going to wrap it up. Alkman says, weird. My Wi-Fi says no internet, but my stream is fine. Chat is silent, though. Well, it's moving along now. Sometimes that happens to me. It says, you don't have enough data for your stream. And it gives me all these warnings. And, like, it looks fine to me. And everybody's like, it's, it's fine. So sometimes they're just wrong. Norm Burles, just put a big nuke with remote control detonator on each island. Then invite the, Ch the Chinese to come on. Ellen Harry's just send the U.S. Navy in. I'm sure Rachel Levine will be great. At, will be a great admiral with all her experience. I'm sure. James McDaniel tsunamis happen. Yeah, the all of those man-made islands. They're not very tall. They're not very high above uh, sea level. So I, I was thinking that too when I saw them. Is um, a big storm might wipe those suckers out. Faithless says, was she being a general or a mommy? I don't know, but it sounds like she wasn't very good. It sounds like she just was not doing her job very well, and she got replaced by a man, and let's hope that he does much, much better. Granite State, man, we have a war going, happening here on our border, and the elites do nothing. Yes, but they want to go secure Ukraine's border. Rusinus, it's amazing how many Americans abhor American nationalism but turn out to be Ukrainian nationalists. Yep. Uh, 11Z5V put an infantry man in charge of the border. Just put Matt in charge of the border. Just and, and give him carte blanche. He can do whatever he wants. He'll solve the problem pretty quickly. Uh, rational wrong think just have to take out one damn wall in China and they're in major troubles. We shall see. Nuke tsunami. Graham Godfrey, a hypersonic missile on the south bank of three gores would set China back to the dark ages during the rainy season. Yep. Oh, somebody was saying faithless as the egg. I thought that too. That cartel leader, it says El Huevo. I'm like, the egg? They often say huevos to mean like balls. He's got the balls. He's got the huevos. But he only has one. He's got the ball. El Huevo, the egg, the ball. <laughs> I don't know what that is. That was so weird what his name is. All right. It is 8.48. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this puppy up. Uh, I think we will go ahead and do a stream next week, but it will not, it will be a little bit different. I'm not going to be doing the kind of prep that I usually do for a show because we're going to be coming back from our trip. I might not, I might just hang out with my stepson until he has to leave at six o'clock and then the show starts at seven 30. So, um, what I may do, I don't know that I can take calls because of some of the technical issues that we've had. I, I, I'm going to look into it this week. 
Uh, even if I don't take calls, I can probably do questions on here. So everybody for sure think of good questions. You know what might be really good is if you send me some by email in advance. And once again, my email address is contactlaurel at protonmail.com. I'm going to put it up here. Whoopsie. I just start writing it wrong. Contact Laurel at protonmail.com. And if you send me questions in advance, then um, I can I can vet them a little bit and pick some of the really good questions. And um, and we will definitely be doing those next week. Okay, I think that that is a wrap for tonight. I had a really good time. It was a really good show, you guys. And I will see you next week. Bye-bye.